Okay. Now can, you hear me? Hey. Now, now can you hear me? I can. How are you, Dave? You can? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you for joining us. I take it you're at home in McLean? I am at home in McLean, yes. Okay. You, and you, you are at church in Holland. Right, at a place called Hope, Hope Church. So, at a place I, called Hope. I yeah, like that. Yeah, and we'll end up maybe talking a little bit about hope in the face of what's, what's going on. So I have to, I'm going to ask you at the beginning, as you know, a little bit about your personal story and history, which includes sure. our, our common roots at University of Presbyterian Church. Uh, so were you there? Who was, were you there in the Earl Palmer or Bruce Larson? No, it was there? actually before Earl. It, Bruce Larson was there okay. as the pastor. Okay. And uh, so that would have been the 79 through early 80s period. Okay. And uh, I didn't really know Bruce uh, well. Uh, in right. fact, I, I didn't really know him at all. Uh, the, the key figure for, for me was Steve Hayner, who was right. the student uh, pastor of student ministries for, and he was the one who, who ran the inn. I don't know if you remember the inn or were familiar with it. You know, I, it. I didn't know Steve, but my brother and sister-in-law, who were leaders at UPC, uh, were good friends of his. I think maybe they were in a Bible study group or a small prayer group or something like that, and they spoke very warmly of Steve, as you have. And, and, and that was an amazing uh, university student gathering, I guess, during that time. Yeah, it really was. It really was. When, when Steve started it in the early 70s, I think there were 30 people that were meeting in a small building outside the church. And right. when I got there, there were more than 900 students every Tuesday night. Yeah. Uh, and we were meeting in the sanctuary. Yeah, that's fantastic. By the way, we're uh, experimenting with a totally new way of bringing people in here to Hope Church this morning. So I'm looking, if I look at a camera, not at you, then I think you should see me looking at you. Uh, but sometimes I'll look at my, uh, at the people that are here and sometimes I'll, I can't resist looking at you on the screen. So that's uh, <laughs> whatever is comfortable for you is great, great with me. What, what, what was your affiliation with? I, whoop, I'll, 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 hey. Yeah so, yeah, so people will be able to speak to you directly, and you'll be able to see them uh, in this Great. room. Okay, terrific. And they'll, they'll be mic'd. Uh, they'll, they'll be mic'd directly. So. Okay. All right. Yes. So, uh, uh, oh, right. So I don't know if you heard what he said, but this is uh, also feeding Facebook Live. And so we have somebody monitoring that, and if somebody uh, voices a question in writing, then we have somebody here who can, who can give voice to that question to you. So uh, there, will be, there will be people who are, who are with us who aren't in the room with us here. Great. Okay. That's, that's terrific. Okay. And we're going to start at 9.45, right? Ah. Yeah. No, you can ask him directly. Okay. Okay. Right. 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 We'll give the mic to you. You can do it. <laughs> okay, we got five minute break here. If you if you want, Good. we'll we'll start, and you'll see me start up shortly. So if you need to catch a cup okay. of tea or coffee or something, you can do that. Okay, now. good. As will probably come out, we've had correspondence, and it, it's, it actually started with my writing him a note of appreciation, and so we've kind of become friends, and as you'll see, we discovered we have roots in the same church in Seattle. Oh, 
so, but I've never, it's the first time we've ever talked face to face this close. No. I feel like I know him. Right. Right. Well, good morning, and welcome to you all to our first Hope Church Adult Ed Gathering of the Year at this uh, inaugural session of our series on evangelicalism and Hope Church. 
And it's my honor at this first adult ed gathering to welcome from his McLean, Virginia home when he turns on his camera in a moment, uh, Peter Weiner. Peter is a fellow person of faith with uh, reformed Presbyterian roots. He's a contributor to New York Times and Atlantic writer. He's a commentator on politics and public life and religion for various media. Uh, he was on Jake Tapper with CNN this last week. I've seen him on PBS and other places. And he's the author of a wonderful book, The Death of, of Politics, How to Heal Our Frayed Public After Trump. So Pete, welcome to a place called Hope, uh, Hope Church here in Holland, Michigan. It's great to be with you, Dave, uh, and I, I appreciate the invitation, and to be at a place called Hope is a pretty good place to be at this time. Yeah, we think so, too. So here's our format for this morning. Uh, Pete and I are going to have a conversation for the first part of our session today, and then about halfway through, uh, we'll cut it off and we'll open it up. And our new technology, thanks to Ken and Andrew, uh, will allow you to uh, speak directly on camera to Pete with your comments and your questions. So as we're having this conversation, be thinking about what you're thinking about and what you'd like to ask. So uh, Pete, before engaging our conversation about evangelicalism in America, uh, I'd like to further introduce you to my friends here by just, uh, with the luxury of 60 minutes with you, uh, starting out with a little bit of your life story. You and I have discovered we both have roots in the state of Washington and even in the same Presbyterian church in Seattle. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your story as a Washingtonian and what that church meant to you? Sure, I'm, I'm happy happy to, uh, to do it. I, I was born in Dallas, but we moved to Washington State when I was uh, in first grade, actually. Uh, so I was six years old. Grew up on the east side of the state, a city called Richland, um, southeast side. Um, and th so all my formative years were, uh, were there. I was not really an active Christian um, during much of that uh, time. My, um, my parents, I think, were deists. My, my dad had gone from an evolution, I think, from uh, first he, he, when he was very young as Catholic, but then he broke from the faith. He was an atheist, and then he was really in an agnostic stage for most of his, his life. He came to faith near the end of his life. And my mom, I think, was a deist. I don't really have a memory of going to church when I when I was uh, when I was young. I um, began really, I would say, my my pilgrimage in a serious way. The uh, end of high school, um, really, the summer before my senior year. Uh, my sister, who's five years older, um, had uh, become a Christian. She had been attending University of Washington. She came back that summer. And she was actually interning at a at a church, um, West Side uh, Church, and my for best friend and, and myself, uh, if only Barry Shannon and I, began a journey of faith at about the same time. And it was a very, I would say, intellectual um, approach to faith. I just had a lot of questions. I remember jotting down on my uh, dad's notepad all of these questions about faith and asking Patty about um, about them. And she was really good. She's very thoughtful. Um, she didn't pretend to know answers that she didn't have the answer to, but she was able to give me a, a, a way to think about um, about faith. And I admire her as a human being too. So the way she she embodied those those kind of Christian Christian virtues. Um, so uh, you know that began my journey, and it was a journey that took really years uh, to go through in terms of the struggling with, with, with questions. But then I went to University of Washington in Seattle, and there I um, started attending University Presbyterian Church, which is a uh, large PCA US, PCUSA church mm -hmm. right uh, across the street from, from uh, the University of Washington. And that was a very formative experience day for me. Um, I attended something called the Inn, which was uh, a place that students from University of Washington would gather every Tuesday night. And there was a fellow who was the head of student ministry at that time, Steve Hayner. Um, at the time Steve took over the inn in the early 70s, there were about 30 people that attended. By the time I started attending, there were over 900 people. And it was just a, you know, a time of, of worship. Steve spoke. There was communion every Tuesday night. But there was something magical about that setting. And um, that was really important to me. The relationship with Steve became extremely important to me. There were 
issues that I was struggling with that I had never shared with anybody. And even though I didn't know Steve well, I just had a trust in him. I felt like he was a person of moral and intellectual integrity. And so I remember going to his office to share some things. And that really began a bond that lasted uh, throughout my life up until Steve um, tragically passed away in January of 20, 2015. He later became president of InterVarsity for 13 years and then president of Columbia Theological Seminary. Um, that came out to, to the DC area of my senior year in college and really never, never, uh, never left. And, you know, my faith, faith journeys continued since, um, since then, but, uh, but, but that's it in a nutshell. And another interesting point of coincidence is that Steve Hayner was a very good friend of my brother and sister-in-law. They were in a small group together. So our, our paths crossed in various ways. So after Seattle, you ended up in Washington, D.C. You worked in three Republican administrations, the Reagan and both Bush administrations. Give us your pilgrimage. What, what led you from Seattle to D.C.? And what were you doing in those administrations? Yeah, sure. I, I, I came out on an internship. My, my uh, major was political science. Uh, and I was, uh, wasn't particularly wise as a young person, but I was wise enough to know that political science was not a great major in terms of getting jobs. So I did internships. And I did an internship when I was a junior at the Washington State Senate, which was very helpful and, uh, and made some, some, some friendships, important friendships there. And then my senior year, I got an internship here in the D.C. area at a place called the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And so I came out for a semester, or at least that's what I thought I was doing. Um, but I ended up getting a job that summer at the State Department Commission, which was under the auspices of CSIS, and then got a job as a research analyst uh, in the Latin American program at CSIS um, when that State Department Commission ran, ran out. That really began my, my professional journey. Um, I then ended up at a place, think tank called Public Policy Center. And then I would say, Probably my big or a, a big career break is that I was hired to become a speechwriter for William Bennett, who was then Secretary of Education for, for Ronald Reagan. And at that time, I was in my mid 20s. And, um, you know, that was a big step. And, and I remember when I, when I uh, took that job, the first day I, I went over as a speechwriter, I called my friends at EPBC and said, Look, if I end up flaming out and being a disaster, could I come back and? And work at EPPC. So I, I was not particularly confident in, in my skills and, and I was sort of intimidated, but it worked out and that began my first foray into government. And then when Bill was the so-called drug czar under President George H.W. Bush, I was there with Bill as a speech writer, assistant. I traveled a lot with him. He traveled the country a lot. When he was at Secretary of Education, he visited hundreds of schools. And when he was drug czar, so-called drug czar, he visited a lot of communities. And I was at Empower America, which was a think tank with Jack Kemp, Bill, Gene Kirkpatrick during the 90s. And then I got hired as a speechwriter, a deputy speechwriter for President Bush um, after the uh, 2000 election was, was decided. And uh, Mike Gerson was the chief speechwriter, Mike was one of my closest friends. So I did that 2001, most of 2002. I was there during, of course, 9-11. Um, as well, which we're celebrating, or not celebrating, but commemorating, to, you know, today. And then I was uh, head of the Office of Strategic Initiatives, which is kind of in-house White House think tank, uh, for five years. And so I brought in historians, theologians, uh, public intellectuals to meet with the president. I worked some in communication, some in policy, some in other things, and um, left. And I've been in the think tank world uh, since then. I, I left in 2007. Um, and then became a writer uh, for the New York Times and the Atlantic. Um, and that's, uh, yeah. those are my main so, outlets So uh, you mentioned a couple things there I want to pick up on. One, your friendship with Mike Gerson. And you have a network, a small group of friends, don't you, that has been significant to you. Uh, who are some of the people in that group? Yeah, I, I really do. I mean, I've made a lot of friendships over, over the years. I mean, I, I, one is a part of a book club, which... Includes Mike and uh, another writer named David Brooks, a fellow named Yuval Levin, uh, who was a former colleague, Francis Collins, who used to be the director of National Institutes of, of Health, Gary Haugen, who runs a wonderful organization called International Justice uh, Mission, uh, David Bradley, who was formerly publisher of The Atlantic, uh, and Tim Keller, who's a pastor at, uh, was a pastor, he's now retired at Redeemer 
Presbyterian, James Forsyth, uh, who's another a pastor, Mark Laberton, who's a president of Fuller Theological Seminary, Philip Yancey, who's an author. So that's, that's a book club I have. And then, of course, I have a whole network of friends, writers, public intellectuals who were very important to me and allow me to, you know, just be in conversation and learn. And, and then there's just a whole network of pastors and theologians that I've met over the years who have also been really, really... And I've come uh, to know you as somebody who very, very freely reaches out to this network and welcomes advice and input. Uh, yeah. you, don't, you don't write solo. <laughs> no, no, I... I don't, you know, no man is an island, as John Dunn said, and uh, and and no writer is, or at least this writer isn't. So, for me, it's just a, um, you know, the, the relationships, the friendships, the input, the insights, the wisdom that I benefited from others has been been hugely important to me. So you're a UW, as we said, would say it in Seattle, a political science uh, major, and you ended up as a writer. Um, in an, uh, a life journey that you couldn't have predicted back in your Seattle days. So how did you happen to start writing for the New York Times and Washington Post? And just, and we will get to evangelicalism here, but just tell us a little bit about how you, how, how'd you get that gig? How'd you get those gigs? And how do you, how do, you do it? How do you produce the ideas and the writing uh, that you do for them? And what freedom are you given by them to write and the things you do? Yeah, the, the New York Times, I was reached out to by uh, my editor, uh, Aaron Redica, in December of 2014. <clears throat> he had actually gotten my name from another New York Times uh, reporter that I knew, Matt, Matt By. And Matt said to, to Aaron, look, if you're ever looking for a conservative yeah. writer uh, who has you know some, some interesting things to say, he thought, then... Um, then, then you just think about Pete. And so uh, he reached out to me and we did a sort of trial period where I wrote three or four pieces for the Times to see how that went. And it went well. And so they ended up bringing me on as a contributing opinion writer. Um, and then with The Atlantic, uh, I started, I think it must have been 2018. And that was, again, through, through, a, through a person at that point was associated with The Atlantic, and he had put me in touch with an editor there, Yoni Applebaum, and um, and they, they brought me on. And uh, both of those have been terrific relationships. I'm given huge amount of freedom, basically almost total freedom to, to write about whatever whatever's on my mind and, and heart. You know, I run it by my, my editors uh, before doing it, but I really can't think of hardly anything that I've ever wanted to do that I haven't been able to. I'd say what's what's interesting, maybe particularly for for, for uh, the folks on at your class, is that I've written so in such a um, straightforward and, and candid and outspoken way about my Christian faith in media organizations and institutions and organs that probably aren't usually associated with Christianity. And I think that there are a number of people, particularly I would say in the evangelical world, who think that the world is unremittingly hostile to Christianity. And if, if you somehow give testimony to your faith, they'll shut you down. Um, that hasn't been my experience. Um, Aaron uh, is, is, you know, says he's a, he's an absolutely confirmed atheist. Yoni is, is a, is a very dedicated person to the Jewish faith. And they've been unbelievably supportive in me. And I've probably for the New York times written, by now, you know, a dozen to 15 meditations on Christian faith, not not even Christianity and politics, but about the incarnation, um, the crucifixion, the resurrection, where in the midst of pain, where is God, grace, humility, uh, why, you know, Jesus' right. mode of discourse, the parables and questions. So they've been They've been great. I couldn't ask for more, and they've both become real, really good friends of mine. And when you do that, you're writing for a huge audience between those two periodicals of millions of people, most of whom are secular, progressive. Uh, you're by identity a moderate conservative, a deeply Christian person, and yet you're sometimes exposing the, the dark underbelly of Christianity, uh, including what's happening in today's evangelicalism. So you have in your own mind an underlying purpose. What are you trying to do when you when you write for the audience of those periodicals about the breakup of evangelicalism or the toxicity of the Republican Party, do you have an underlying sense of mission as to what you're trying to do as a person of faith there across all these articles? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I'd say the answer is sort of yes and sort of no. Um, 
honestly, I, I write what's what's really on my mind and heart. Um, and I think if you'd go back and read what I've what I've written in other periodicals, including Christianity Today, and um, and when I blogged at a place called Commentary Magazine, which is a conservative blog. I don't think you would find a distinct difference between what I wrote then and what I write right now. Um, you know, when I when I'm writing, I'm just trying to tell the truth. I would say, as best I understand it, or in some cases, I'm working through questions, and I think I'm trying to bring readers along with me. So when I when I did my essay on where's God in the midst of pain, I really didn't quite know where I was going to end up with that essay. To tell you the truth. Uh, that was an essay of exploration, and as, as, as you alluded to, I reached out to different people. And so sometimes I, I, I actually seek out to write some of these essays to try and think through with more precision how I view these, these issues. In other cases, I'm trying to present a, a picture of Christ as I understand him to the world, including a watching world, including a skeptical world. Um, and I, I just feel like so much of who Jesus is has been obscured, has been disfigured, has been damaged, that if I can do anything to try and present Jesus as I understand him to be, I feel like that will resonate with, uh, with, uh, with, with people. You know, if, you, if you're writing for a so-called secular audience, of course, you have to be alert from time to time in terms of the terms that you use. So if you're if you're writing for Christianity today, there's a certain common knowledge or at least a a, 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 a sem the semantics, the, the locutions, the language that's familiar. And that you can't assume that's going to be the case if you're writing, you know, for a New York Times or an Atlantic audience. But um, yeah, but for the most part, I'm just trying to uh, to bear witness to whatever truth I'm trying to speak without being haughty or arrogant about it. But, but if, you know, these are important matters to me and I'm trying to convey certain things and, and sometimes I'm trying to, to also be open to, uh, to views that are not aligned with, with mine. Right. So I really appreciate those words. I mean, for me in my own writing, discerning and giving witness to truth. I mean, those are my underlying aims beneath whatever is the surface content of the day. Uh, right. When you do this, uh, you must get a lot of blowback. I mean, I can imagine both appreciative emails from people like me and I think most of us who are deeply appreciative of an alternative and more winsome expression of Christian faith for those audiences than what today's evangelicalism tends to be giving the Christian faith. Uh, but you must, so you must get a lot of affirmation and encouragement, but I'm guessing you get a lot of nasty letters too. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I get both. I, I get both. I, I appreciate the affirmation. I take seriously the, 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 the negative feedback unless they're, you know, unless they're kind of screeds and just filled with <laughs> vulgarity and someone venting. There's no there's no point in engaging those. But if I feel like it's a person that's asking in good faith or reasonably good faith, um, you know, I, I, I respond to them. I certainly do that on matters of of faith, I would say that my my faith columns um, are the ones that have elicited probably the most interesting reaction because they're I'll often hear from people who are who are not followers of of Christ, um, but they're interested in in the portrayal that I that I make of of him, and so that can often actually begin a conversation through email with with. Uh, with with people, I you know, there's also been a challenge, uh, you know, to be honest about it, in just in terms of some of my friendships over the years, because I was part of the Republican world, um, and uh, I mean, I worked in three Republican administrations, and of course, the vast majority of Republicans rallied around Donald Trump, and 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 I did not. I was a very vocal and early critic of his, and so that. Yeah, right. You know, put some strain on on relationships, particularly I would say in this political moment where it's I think I'd say unusually heated and animated. Right. There's a so, lot of anger. And so it, it's taken intentionality to uh try and preserve those relationships. Um and uh and also to try and stay open to hearing from people who have a very different view than I do, but 
giving them the space to voice what they believe and why they believe it, which is actually very helpful to me um, in my own writing so I can understand a world that I'm actually not a part of and that I'm a critic of. So I can imagine, uh, it was in 2016 you wrote uh, a New York Times column, Why I Will Never Vote for Donald Trump. And so I can imagine a column like that is going to get a little bit of reaction from uh, fellow Republicans who think you've uh, deserted the cause. But I want to turn now to what is our theme for this series, uh, Evangelicalism and Hope Church. And so as I look at your writings, uh, I've seen two concerns that you've expressed for the state of American evangelism, evangelicalism. One has to do with what evangelicalism is doing to itself, uh, its breakup, its collapse, as you put it. And the other has to do with what the image, the public understanding of today's evangelicalism is doing to Christian witness and the and the and and the uh, the outreach of the faith. And from my perspective, I see two rather distressing trends, and I think you've articulated these too. One is that white evangelicalism, in the face of the media as it's presented to us, has become associated with so much that's seemingly toxic with white nationalism, uh, anti-science, anti-vaccine, uh, opposition to teaching racial history, uh, worship of Donald Trump, uh, anti-democratic conspiracy theories and so forth. That's evangelicalism to so many Americans today. And at the same time, over the same period of time, the last decade or so, we've seen an erosion in the number of people in the United States who actively identify with Christian faith. Both right. Pew and Gallup have found at least a 10% decline from, like in the case of Pew, from 73%, 75% down to 63% of people who say they're actively Christian. And this is especially true among younger Americans, of whom the number of religious nuns, I have no religious faith, has gone so dramatically up in the last 10 years. So uh, my question is, uh, are these two trends just coincidental, or do you think there's a connection. Has today's evangelicalism undermining the witness and the winsomeness of Christian faith and of church engagement? Yeah, I think absolutely they have, and they're 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 intimately connected. Uh, it's not solely cause and effect. I, I think the reason that the nuns issue numbers have have, have gone up w would have risen even if the evangelical church had an entirely different posture uh, during this this period and its political involvement was responsible rather than what I would say is irresponsible and and reckless but but I think a huge amount of this is is driven um, by by it I and I say that both anecdotally and also I think empirically because the evidence seems seems to 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 show it I um, a couple of years ago I uh, was back in Washington state and I had breakfast with a fellow named Carl Coppock, who's a close friend and was instrumental. It was the first person I had a Bible study with even before I was a Christian in, in my senior year in high school. And um, so I stayed in close touch with Carl over the years and we were having breakfast. And I asked him about what was happening um, in terms of that very question, issue of the Christian witness. And he said, uh, Pete, this is a generational catastrophe. And I've heard that from a lot of pastors and I've heard it from a lot of younger people. Um, and, you know, I think the simple way to think about it is they look at what's unfolding and they think this is a moral freak show. Why would I want to join this group? Um, it's not only that it's, uh, you know, not particularly inviting, but they find it to be offensive and very much at odds with what I think the proclamation of Christ is supposed to be. And they see in their eyes, and I think reasonably so, what they deem as a huge amount of, of, of hypocrisy. Um, and to me, that's the most painful, personally painful thing of, of the last half dozen years, which is the way in which the witness of Christ has been so damaged and so distorted because of this wedding with a and this twinning of, with a political movement that I think is in so many ways antithetical to Christ and is even at its core almost nihilistic. And uh, when that happens, you know, 
you can you can make all the arguments you want on the on on the you know, the veracity of the manuscript copies and you know you can give hand out copies of Tom Wright N.T. Wright's book uh, Jesus the Resurrection of the Son of Man and make the apologetics case for 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 Christianity but when they see that happening that's hugely damaging the other thing I'd ask add to that Dave is that you also have just tremendous amount of scandals from extremely important sources. I mean, one of the one of the largest um, Christian apologetics organizations in the world, Ravi Zacharias, uh, we it was on, you know we found out that this was terrible sexual abuse. Leaders of the largest Protestant denomination in the United States, the Southern Baptist Convention, terrible things having to do with sexual abuse and <clears throat> and covering it up led Beth Moore and and Russell Moore to to lead the leave the S. SBC, the, one of the largest Christian universities in the world, Liberty University's President Jerry Falwell Jr. left under a cloud of scandal. Hillsong United, one of the most uh, important and well-loved uh, Christian, <clears throat> contemporary Christian music groups, the home church and some of the satellite churches waylaid by, um, by, by scandal. Uh, you know, so you see this kind of <clears throat> happening um, over and over again, and in places that are not small institutions, and people say, "Well, what <clears throat> what's going on here? You got to say one thing, and <clears throat> you're living a life that's contrary to it. Probably less honorable in some ways than than the secular world. And then you you plaster Christian explanations and justifications uh, to try and pretty it up. So when that happens, you're you're going to ha have a real problem." With uh, with with being uh, you know with inviting people in and trying to to tell them this this is a group where you're going to have a safe harbor and a safe place where you're going to find peace joy the the fruit of the spirit. I thought you expressed that dismay so well in your May article in the Atlantic, uh, commenting on the what was happening in the Southern Baptist Church. You wrote, "It's nearly impossible to overstate how much damage these new revelations, these necessary and long overdue revelations." are doing to the Christian witness. No atheist, no secularist or materialist could inflict nearly as much damage to the Christian faith as these leaders within the Christian church have done. So you're not one to, to mince uh, difficult words even when speaking prophetically to your own faith. I, I wanna take it from there to a, a, another question that uh, came up in your uh, November Atlantic essay, which many of us have read, and which Peter uh, helped inspire this uh, series that we're having right now. You distinguish between today's evangelicalism and authentic faith. You wrote, much of what's distinctive about evangelicalism has become antithetical to authentic Christianity. What we're dealing with, not in all cases, of course, but in far too many, is political identity and cultural anxieties, anti-intellectualism and ethnic nationalism, resentments and grievances, all dressed up as Christianity. So that raises a question, and I would think some people might raise, uh, kind of, if I could play a little bit of devil's advocate here, who gets to define what authentic Christianity is? So we here at Hope Church have some idea of what that is. Mega evangelicals have an idea of what they believe, um, I'm wondering how you define and distinguish uh, authentic Christianity from, from other forms of uh, people who name the name of Jesus. And I, I'd offer just a thought and just to kind of spark the conversation here and see if this makes any sense to you. I'm guessing we'd agree that what it is, it's not my social views. It's, authentic Christianity is not a matter of my political party, my worship style, uh, the details of my theology. Uh, we have differences across the, across the gamut, but it seems to me that for me, authentic faith, authentic Christianity involves two things. One, it's theistic. It asserts there is a God, but it's not me. And because it's not me, and I'm a finite, fallible creature, uh, all of my beliefs are subject to correction. There's error in them. So to me, the first aspect of a authentic faith is a theism that leads to a spirit of humility, recognizing there is a God, but it's not me. And then the second thing is, if we're followers of Jesus, we should somehow be exemplifying the mandates that Jesus exemplified and taught us. 
or the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. Those two things are kind of theism-based humility and attitudes and policies and uh, a life that embodies and embraces the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, after that, anything goes. Now, but maybe you have a different definition of what authentic faith is as differentiated from what you see going under the name of Christianity today. Yeah, I, know, I think that's a very articulate and helpful um, uh, analysis and, and uh, categorization of, 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 how you, um, of how you determine those things. I mean, I think the short answer, I would say, was what you're getting at, and particularly in your second point. I mean, I'd say probably the acid test here is, are the two great commandments. Jesus did us the favor of, of answering that question, which is to love God with all, all your heart and to love your neighbor as, your, as yourself. And, and then Paul, of course, describes the fruit, fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, uh, and, and so forth. And so, you know, I, I think one judge of that is, <clears throat> does, does a person's life reflect the, the life, even if, even if imperfectly, of, um, of, of Christ? Um, and uh, do you see the, the, those fruits in, 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 their, in their life? Um, you know, I'm very sympathetic to what you talked about, this <clears throat> theistic humility, um, this what, what I would refer to as, as uh, epistemological hu humility, which I do think is is a Christian concept. I mean, Paul used the phrase, we, we see through a glass darkly and then, and then face to face. And everything, certainly in the Reformed view of Christianity, uh, but, but as a general matter, I think this is true of most people of the Christian faith, that all parts of our life are touched or tinted or tainted by by, by sin, including including our, our minds um, and our and our perspectives. And I'd say one of the things that I'm more alert to than I was certainly 10, 15 years ago is the degree to which all of us uh, are shaped by dozens and dozens of factors that we're really not even aware of. Um, our families of origin the communities that we've been a part of, the circle of friends that, that we have, our own temperament and, and, and uh, dis dispositions, um, the, the, the pressures that, that we feel, stated and unstated, um, the expectations that we, that we feel like we have, um, you know, our, our the own fears that people have, which is if they, if they say this or do this, uh, do they go outside of their, of their, of their tribe? Um, so all of us are a product of those things, the country that you live in, the era that you live in, the race that you are, the gender that you are. Uh, so, of course, you and I, Dave, will look and interpret faith differently than if we lived in the 14th century in a different continent and we were, you know, we were women. Um, and uh, so we all have to take that into account. And so in a sense, you know, Steve told me, it actually was in the last conversation that I had with him before he passed away. He said, I, I believe in objective truth, uh, but I, I hold lightly to my ability to un understand or perceive that truth. And that struck me as, as a very deep and wise point, which is truth exists. We just have to approach it with some degree of, of humility and to hold somewhat lightly to certain things and always be open to amendment and, and, um, and correction. But look, in the end, you know, who's to determine what's the authentic Christian faith? Uh, I mean, that's probably going to just ultimately be Jesus, you know, in, 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 uh, because um, I can make my case and I can make my arguments. I can cite scripture and people who have vastly different views than me and consider me even a pernicious force in Christianity. And I have friends who really do believe that I am that, that, that I'm too unremitting of a critic of evangelicalism, that I'm hurting the Christian witness by, by airing in a sense, dirty laundry. I mean, they would, they would say that they're seeking truth. Uh, and, and they have scriptures that they can cite, you know, Shakespeare was right. The devil can quote scripture for his own purposes. The, the scriptures is so multivocal. There are obviously 66 books, so many different authors writing in so many different times under so many different circumstances that you can find a, a verse or verses to justify almost anything. 
And so then it's like, well, how does how do you determine what applies in any given set of circumstances? And there it's discernment and wisdom. And there's no arbitrator that you or I can go to and say, well, this person is determined that you and I are right or you and I are, are, are wrong. So I do think that even get, given those limitations, I do think the notion of what the fruits are in a, in a human life um, and whether on the most important things that Christ spoke about, we embody those things, we radiate to some degree or another those things. That's a pretty good uh, test, not the only test, but it's a pretty important one. Those are great words, and I, I appreciate also what you said about the two commandments uh, and holding to truth, but holding it lightly. I mean, I think uh, we, we sometimes think we're to love God with our heart, soul, and mind, and worshiping God with our mind is being open to learning and growth. Uh, one of our long ago pastors here quoted, I thought it was Camus, but I've never found it in Camus' writings, that sometimes life beckons us to make a 100% commitment to something about which we're 51% sure. And that's always been very encouraging to me, that I could take the leap of faith, I could engage my life here wholeheartedly without being absolutely certain that everything I give affirmation to is true in exactly the way I understand it. Well, I want to open it up here to questions, but before I do, I want to ask you just, I want to come back to the personal. We started with the personal. And I'd like to ask you, Pete, just how you're coping with this present time. You're a Rock River long-term Republican that has seen your party taken over by something you find anathema. Your identity has been, I think, I don't know if it still is, evangelical, and yet you've seen evangelical identity become something other than what you embraced uh, as an evangelical. So um, as you've witnessed what's happening in your party and in your religious heritage, how are you coping? Are you dis discouraged? Are you depressed? Are you lamenting? <laughs> Yeah, I know. Thanks. Thanks for asking. It's, it's, it's a good question. I mean, there's some lamentation for sure, I would say, because of, I think, the broader project, uh, which is which is the, the Christian witness, um, as we've talked about, has has been really, I think, so, so damaged. Uh, you know, I'd say personally, I'm I'm holding up pretty well. And I'll tell you why. Um the first reason is I, I think if you'd have asked pre-Trump, um, you know, the 20 or 25 people who know who knew, know me or knew me best um, and ask where would I end up in this moment, um, I think most of them, almost all of them, would have said that if I ended up any place other than I have, they would have been disappointed in me. And I would have been disappointed in myself. Um, and so I think I have a community of, of, of close friends, um, really intimate friends, siblings who, uh, who, who have been supportive of me, um, and encouraging to me rather than turning on me. I, I think if that had happened, you know, that would be very difficult if it were simply, if I were isolated. And of course, I'm also of the view that if the people who are most important in your life think you have something wrong, whether it's theological or intellectual or, or, or certainly in your own life, how you're leading your life, you've always got to pay attention to that. I mean, the reflex is always to, to defend yourself and to say, you know, you don't understand or you're missing something. But I've, I've always tried, even if imperfectly, to keep an avenue open if if people think there's something that you've got wrong. I think in this case, I've, I've, the people whom I respect, who I trust, who have walked the journey of faith with me, my intellectual journey, most of them, I think, are, are there not all. And, and again, I've had I've had to navigate some some relational challenges. Um, so that's that's helped me uh, help me to uh, second thing I'd say, Dave, is I've ne not been really throughout my life. I just don't think I'm hardwired to be a, a joiner of institutions or organizations or categories. So I'm not, I don't consider myself a Republican anymore, but I, but being a Republican was not that big of a deal to me. I was a conservative 
philosophically, uh, the way I would tell people, I'd say I'm a Christian first, then a conservative, then a Republican. And for me, the Republican Party was just an instrument, a, an instrumentality to try and advance ideals or, or convictions that I, that I had. And when it ceased to be that, in my estimation, it wasn't a problem to say I'm, 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 I'm leaving, leaving this. Same thing with evangelicalism. I don't call myself an evangelical anymore for several reasons. One is I think it's just, you know, there's so many, uh, it's, it's accrued so many negative connotations uh, that anytime you say I'm I'm so, I'm something I'm X but, and you spend most of the time on the but, <laughs> explaining why you're that thing, it's usually a, a clue that there's something something amiss. Also, honestly, even in my own theological journey, there there are elements of evangelicalism that I think I'm probably not as comfortable with as I as I've been in 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 the past. So I consider myself, you know, probably a C.S. Lewis mere mere Christian mere Christian. Um, and and follower of uh, right. of Jesus, right. um, and you know my theological convictions shift in shape uh, according to people that I'm in conversation with, things I'm reading, things I'm 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 thinking. Thank you, thank you. Well, now it's time to give anybody here a chance to get into the conversation, and uh, you'll be able to see and hear what people want to say. Uh, we have a large group here this morning, so I would just ask you to say your name for the sake of the other people here, so we can uh, know who you are and, and get to know you better. So, uh, Bob, there's a question there from Tim Penny. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a personal question, uh, sure. the same one that I asked uh, over the years many of my college students. I asked uh -huh. them to write a paper, and they need to choose between these two. Okay. I am a seeker of truth. I am a child of God. Doesn't mean they can't be both, but what is, how do they see themselves at their core? So if you have an answer and an explanation, that would be great. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a great uh, that, that's a great question, a very provocative question. Um, boy, I, I mean, my first instinct is I'd say I, I, I'd be very wary about putting one above, above the other, which I'll explain. I, I suppose I would say child of God and then seeker of truth. The reason I'm hesitant to say it is um, I've long felt and certainly believe now that to believe you're a child of God can lead you into all sorts of dark alleyways. And if you're not a seeker of truth, you may think you're a seeker of truth, but you may be a seeker of identity. You may be a seeker of tribalism. You may be a seeker of ideology. And then you, that's what's what you're after and then you take christianity and that's subordinate to it uh, my friend russell moore has, has has used the phrase before uh that people use jesus as a hood ornament and um and and i think that's i think that's that's right so i think if you know if you're not a seeker of truth you can be a you can be a person of the christian faith or you can claim to be a person of the christian faith but you can bring along into it and with it all sorts of things that have nothing to do with Christianity and are sometimes contrary to, to Christianity. And I think the ongoing search for truth, at least for me, is really, really important. Um, and um, I think we just need to be alert uh, to claiming to be a child of God without being a seeker of truth. And, and honestly, sometimes... I have found it's it's a fascinating thing for me to see um, when close friends of mine who, who are followers of Christianity um, will say the Bible teaches X, and I have to believe that, even if that belief is contradicted overwhelmingly by by science. Uh, and, and I've even had them honestly say, I can't answer to leading scientists the objections they have to, to what I happen to believe as a person of faith. But I believe the Bible teaches us. The Bible has full authority. And I'm very, very confident this is quite clearly what the Bible teaches. And it has to be true. And everything else has to bend to that. And I understand that impulse. And, and I think there's something you said for it. But when that attitude causes you to bend truth, reality, or science, because you say 
faith is premis inter paris. Um, that, ag again, can lead you into all sorts of bad places. I mean, the most one obvious example would be, you know, the Copernican revolution in Galileo. I mean, there were scripture verses that the people cited that exist um, that led them to believe that the sun revolved around the earth. And when science said no, they said it has to be. The Bible teaches it. It's very clear. Here are the verses. Science has to subordinate or bend to faith. Well, we're, we're long past that point now. We've figured out, oh, our hermeneutics was actually off. And um, so that's, right. that's just part of what I, right. I, um, I struggle with. But right. it's an interesting, good question, and keep asking it of your students. Thank you. Who's next? Just say, wait for the mic. What? Oh, you do have. For people at home, uh, okay. After. Hi, I'm Larry Schuyler. Hey, Larry. I, I would like to ask you if you give more definition to the term "breaking up." Do you mean more of a splintering of everybody going their own way? Do you mean more like a sinking ship that's breaking up and going down? Um, and if it's going down, what is rising? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, I, I think I probably meant some of some of both. Uh, the main thing that I meant was that there was a fracturing that was occurring within the evangelical church, a, a kind of, of splintering. And I drew that conclusion in part because for that particular essay that I that I wrote back last uh, last October. Um, you know, I reached out to dozens and dozens of pastors and theologians. And when I reached out to them, I told them what my thesis was, which is I, th I thought that there was a sort of kind of crack up or splintering of, of, the, uh, of the evangelical church fracturing, and that there's something that was going on within the spirit of churches themselves. They were si simply becoming more acrimonious. And there were more divisions, not just on politics, by the way, but on other issues, too. And well, what struck me was that not a single person that I reached out to um, challenged my thesis. And a number of them basically said, you don't know the half of it. And so pastors began to pour out to me their stories of what they had, of, of what they had witnessed within their congregations. The lack of charity, the quick to the trigger to be judgmental, uh, almost a, a tropism to, to go toward division and, and, and conflict. Um, and, you know, pastors were just felt vulnerable, often isolated, worn down. Um, and we're seeing that actually is just empirically that the number of pastors are leaving, leaving the ministry. Um, and then there's this phenomenon that's, that's now in the news called sort of quiet quitting, which is you don't actually leave a job, but you're, you do de minimis for it. Um, and pastors were noticing this, you know, in Presbyterian circles on, on, on sessions and so forth. And so it was this, this distemper uh, that, that seemed to be, to be uh, in churches. Um, and that's just creating a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of strain. So some of that breaking apart is, is happening where, where churches are having conflicts, even though the church is, is not splitting, uh, at least not technically splitting but it's almost de facto splitting. And then some of it is just within the denomination. So you see things like, um, I mentioned earlier, Russell Moore and Beth, Beth Moore left the Southern Baptist Convention because of, of what, what's, what's unfolded uh, there. And then you have some churches like, you know, Mars Hill uh, and, and, and Mark Driscoll. There's been a lot of attention to that, particularly with this uh, podcast that Christianity Today has done a really excellent one called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. In some cases, those churches just just sink. Uh, Mark Driscoll's now shown up again. He's a pastor at a church in, in, in Arizona. Um, and then you've got this, these, you know, the numbers of what, what Dave was referring to earlier, you know, in terms of, of, uh, of younger people. What will replace it? You know, I don't know. In the end, the, the, the gates of hell sh won't prevail. And this could be a shaking out period, and what emerges could be much better uh, and much much more uh, faithful. But when you go through these kind of convulsions, these transitions, yeah, it can be a painful um, a painful process, and you don't really know what's what's going to uh, what's going to replace it. But um, but the Christian faith is not going to disappear. 
uh, because we've uh, because the Lord's not going to allow that. Um, but but how that all unfolds um, is is often something of a mystery to us. Thank you. Great question. Great answer. I want to say to those on Facebook Live that you're welcome to uh, type a question into the chat function, and Judy Parr will read it for you. Okay. Uh, this is Bob Giroux, and I have a hey, couple Bob. of I have a couple of images I want you to think about. As I was driving in here this morning, I found myself at a stop sign when looking at the back of an SUV, and at the top on the window was a large bumper sticker that said, I support life with an image of a, a baby in a womb. And I was just kind of looking at that. And then I realized there was another bumper sticker down in the lower left-hand corner. And that bumper sticker said, um, it was much smaller. Um, I'm older, it was harder to read. Uh, and it said, I support life. Oh, first of all, it had an image of two, two handguns facing each other. I support life, liberty, and the pursuit of those who represent us. And I, 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 the, 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 the two images just kind of hit me full force. And I'm sitting there, and, I'm, and, and then the other image I have for you is last night. I'm looking at the Economist magazine cover, and it's the Statue of Liberty, and the base is broken apart, and the Statue of Liberty is trying to straddle it as it's pulling away from each other. And I wonder, with those two images, what you see as the role of a Christian like yourself or with your perspective in how to bridge that, how to repair that, how to heal that. Because um, yeah. that was a deeply disturbing image this morning. Yeah, no, I can understand why it, why it was. It, uh, what is it? In, in Paul in Corinthians talks about kind of clanging symbols. And that, that must have been sort of a clanging symbol effect for, for you. Um, you know, it's, it's a really good question. And I, I, I ask myself this actually um, not infrequently, and I ask it of others. I've, it's, it's been a topic of conversation, quite honestly, in the last couple of weeks, which is, you know, how, how do I envision my role and the role of others in this moment and the, the, the roles that each of you would 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 play in this in this moment about about bridging bridging the gap um you know i i would say that it's trying to balance two things at once um one is and dave will know more much more about this than than, than i do um, but I do think that psychology and neuroscience has a lot to teach us about, about this moment and how to reach people that, that you believe have gone to um, difficult or indefensible or dark, dark places politically. Certainly in my experience, um, the way that I've been able to get through to people is when they feel like they're getting from me a relationship that's trusting and that I'm leaning into their lives, that I know about their lives, that I'm not just trying to lecture them or overpower them with arguments and convince them that they're wrong. Uh, we just know from, from uh, study after study after study about how the human mind works and the human personality works that if you have a certain deep conviction on something and somebody is trying to overpower you with arguments or evidence, it doesn't work. In fact, often it has the opposite effect. People, and you may have experienced this in your own life, uh, where people seem to dig in their heels more strongly and lash out and they get agitated and angry. Um, it's because anytime any of us have a core identity that we think is under attack or being challenged, we don't react well to that. We, we just instinctively get, get defensive. If the only thing that you're hearing from somebody who's challenging you on some core identity, whether it's theological or political or, or other social, um, and the only thing you hear from them is you're wrong and here's why you're wrong, um, that's not gonna work. Where it, does have an effect is if there's a friendship, there's a relationship, there's a trust. And those people then allow you to enter into their life, just like you might allow them to enter into your life. And then often in my experience, sort of the guards go down, the defensiveness goes down, 
I found when I've uh, expressed to people who are Trump supporters some of my own sort of questions uh, or my own struggles that I'm going through, that has given opened the way for them to uh, reveal much more of their own uncertainties and their own struggles than they have. Um, and when you when you um, invest in somebody's life, if you know about their children, if you know about their their experience difficulty growing up, if you know something about people in their lives who have passed, if you're able to connect with them through music or through sports or through faith, um, that I think is the best way to to reach people. And even if you don't come to common ground on certain issues, it diffuses the tension and it stops the dehumanization because it's 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 hard to, you know we, we particularly in this era it's we turn each other into monsters into caricatures into cartoon images and when you're dealing with somebody who seems to be kind and care about you and they have a different view than you 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 say okay well these people aren't aren't you know inhumane they just have some different perspective or they're wrong. They're, they're wrong. So that is a general matter, I would say, is, is the best way. It's I don't know how to do this writ large. There are organizations like Braver Angels, if you if you Google them, that that are, I think, really admirable. Um, and I think we need more of that. Having said that, I also think it's important to speak the truth and to speak it candidly and openly. Uh, and so I, somebody in politics who appreciates what Liz Cheney, uh, very much what she's done, um, because I, you know, Vaclav Havel, who, who was a real model for me in a lot of ways, the former Czech dissident and president, um, said you, that people have to live within the truth, that you can't live within the lie. And I just feel like too many people are living within a lie rather than the truth. And you have to be able to say that and to say it in ways that I think are direct, but not overly personal or ad hominem. And so trying to balance those two things is is a real challenge. I've tried to do it in, in my life and writing, and I'm sure I've failed uh, at it. Pete, I think you've done admirably well in your life and writing. We've come to the end of our hour here. I, I just want to say that uh, two things to you. One, just thank you so much for giving us uh, an hour of your time uh, to share your life and your witness and so forth. And the second thing I want to say to you just is how much your writing means to so many of us. There was one person who had to leave here uh, a few minutes ago who said she's been a fan of yours. She's got a file of all your writings. And she's just so excited to hear you uh, speaking today. You've been given an extraordinary platform to speak to a large segment of the culture and its political and civic leaders and even its academic leaders. And in this day and age, uh, when we so need a winsome expression of what I truly think is authentic faith, uh, you're, a, you're a beacon of hope and a bright light for so many of us. So thank you for being here, and keep on. We wish you blessings upon you. And with that, we send you off. Thanks, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. So just a final word, Bob uh, or Jane, do you want to say a little bit about what comes next? Yes. Thank you. I'm Jane Schuyler. I'm chair of adult ed. And I just want to give a huge thank you to David and to Bob Lydens. Um, we've been working on this four-part series since like January, February. Um, so a lot of work has gone into this. And I am so thankful um, for these committee members who have put this together. And I'm really glad that all of you came today. Uh, thank you. Um, if you pick up the brand new edition of the Salt and Light, which is out today, you should have received a link in your email. Um, but the four-part series is um, right there on page three. And next week, you will see, the, excuse me, see that Dennis Vosco, a historian, will be here to give us some historical background about evangelicalism, and Dan Griswold will also um, give some reflection about that, some theological reflection about that historical background. So we invite you back next week. Now I have to also invite those of you who are able-bodied and willing. We have to transform this because it's raining, 
And so we need to do our church picnic today indoors. So we need 19 tables with 10 chairs at each. <laughs> so if you can help transform that in the next 10 minutes, that'd be great. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>